Hello, family. Welcome back to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty Guadagno, and today I'm joined by T.I. And I we came, I, we came across a, a, a podcast that T.I. had been on, one of the members of our IONS team, and he was just raving about it in one of our team meetings. And so I reached out to connect right away. Uh, T.I. is a spiritual medium, an author, a poet, and we just had a real cool little conversation five minutes before we pressed record, and I can't wait to hear about your experiences. Thank you so much for being of service to our community. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I am part of that community, so there's that. So um, I suppose I should tell you a little bit about myself. I, um, I was born in the middle of the last century. And I grew up in a house in the northwest side of Chicago, where I was the fourth generation living in that house of my father's family. And the house was, um, well, I've been in haunted places before. This place was haunted on another level. There were so many spirits there. It was, it was very noisy. And there were ghosts of my ancestors, as well as the ghosts of the people who had built the house and lived there prior to my ancestors who bought it in the late 1800s. Um, so as a child growing up, I was three months old when we moved into that house. And as I was developing schemas for what the world is, I was also seeing and hearing and experiencing these things that others call quote unquote paranormal. Um, they may be anomalous because they don't happen all the time, but they are as normal as watching the birds outside my window right now. These things are everywhere and happen all the time. So when I was a baby, a toddler, and I'm learning this is a dog, this is a cat, this is the couch, and this is that thing that talks to me in my ear. And I didn't have a name for them. We had names for the individual ghosts that were there that my siblings and I saw together. Um, but I didn't think of it as something, I, at that time I didn't think of it as something anomalous. It was just part of the natural world. And it was something that we dealt with. Um, there were spirits that were very predictable and those were actually reassuring when we would see them. And then there were some that were very unpredictable. And those were the ones that helped create the chaos that I grew up in, the spiritual and emotional chaos that I grew up in. So when my family moved away from that house, I was, um, I lived my first 11 years, I think there. And then we moved to a new house. And for the first time I realized that that isn't everywhere because our new house was so quiet. We were all commenting on it. And then we started telling stories about things that had happened in that house. Now, what happens when you, as a very small child, and the first 10 years of your life, experience something, you remember what it is. For example, if you grow up with a lilac in your yard and you go someplace and even if you can't see it, but you smell the lilacs, you know it's a lilac. Even if you can't see it, if it's outside someplace, and you go, oh, that's a lilac. Well, this is what happened to me growing up, where I can recognize when there is something, when there is a sentient person, being, who is non-corporeal, who is non-carbon-based, I say, in the space with me. So I can sense ghosts. Um, I can sense, um, I've had many experience with both the newly and long dead. Um, newly being where they're still very closely connected to us here. That's, that's the most, um, those are the most encounters I've had with the dead. Um, I've also had encounters with things like forest spirits and other entities I have had very close contacts with something that I call a grief eater. Um, this, is a, this is an entity, this is a sentient being, um, person, if you will, that dwells in burial places. And I, when people go to cemeteries and 
you know, they get scared out, you know, people go there to do, teenagers will go there to scare themselves or whatever, and things happen to frighten them and send them away. This more often than not is that grief eater, because this is something that not only protects the space and guards that sacred space, but has a symbiotic relationship with we human beings in that when we go to a burial ground or a cemetery, we literally open up the ground. And this is where this thing dwells. It comes from the earth. It's an earth elemental spirit. And we pour our grief. We weep. We, we just let, let it out. And the, the reason I call this entity a grief eater is that for this being, this is its sustenance. And so when we go to the cemetery, we can release some of our grief and they benefit from the grief that we release. So it's very symbiotic with, with humans. Um, I've, you know, there are stories from all around the world about guardian spirits around burial grounds and every cemetery or burial place, um, even unmarked burial places that I have been, I have recognized this a grief eater it's not just one it's uh, many but I've gotten to a place in my life where I am also recognized by them and they've helped me with some things in different places so these are some of the these are some of the ways that that growing up with that part of your mind that part of your brain being developed uh, be, being able to sense um, non-corporeal energies around us that has lent to a very interesting life that I've lived in that liminal place um, between here and there. So, um, yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. First of all, I love the term grief eater. And I've never thought of I was even envisioning the land itself kind of being that sentient being, you know, and I've never really conceptualized any of that stuff. So thank you so much for kind of opening up some new loops for me to kind of dive into. I love that. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the recording started and you were sharing about some outer body experiences. And I want to see if you'll take some space to share about that. Certainly. So, um, so growing up, in that house, I, I, I described some of the ghosts that were very predictable as being comforting, but there were others that were predictable that were very disturbing. And when I was um, about five years old, initially, we all of my siblings, I come from a family of 10 children in 13 years. I'm the third. So there was a baby every year and pretty much. And uh, we slept with all of us dormitory style in the big room in the front of the upstairs. And then when I got a little bit older, my older sister Kate and I um, got to have our own room. And this was really exciting. Um, now the room, it was a small room and it was in the eve. So it had a sloping ceiling um, and small windows. The window, there was one window close to the floor and there was a closet in there that oddly was connected to the closet in the master bedroom at the front of the house. You could actually go in one door and sneak through to the other room, which we never, ever did. I mean, we were children. This would have been a really fun thing to play, but we would not go in this closet. There was something extremely foreboding in that closet. And we knew it when we were in the big bedroom. And we knew it when we were moved to the little bedroom that shared that closet. And so Kate and I would very obsessively make sure that closet door was closed. And we would, um, it had a, an old brass carved doorknob. So, and it, and it had the apparatus in the lock that it would latch. So you could push the door closed and if you pulled on it, it wouldn't open. You'd hear the click when you turned the handle. So we would make sure, each of us would make sure and pull on that door before getting in bed. And then when we get in bed, we would scoot to the center of the bed and sit, sleep back to back and tuck everything in, even in really hot weather. We pulled a sheet up over us because in that place, any part of your body that was exposed 
would be touched and you could feel the icy touch, like your hand stroked or your back. And I would even cover my ear because someone would come close and whisper my name in my ear. So we would scooch back to back, covered up, bundled up, and we would we would chant sleep, sleep together so that we would fall asleep together because it was not a good idea to be the only one awake in that house. Um, it was, it was very frightening. It was, it was very scary. So we would do this every night. And one night I woke up and it was dark and it was quiet. And I woke up on my back and this already was kind of disturbing because I tried to, you know, we kept our backs together for protection. So I am laying on my back and the house is silent. I tried listening for the sound of a television downstairs or my parents in their room. There was nothing. There weren't even, um, this was on the northwest side of Chicago and we didn't live on a busy street, but on the other side of the alley was a busy street. So even late in the evening, you could hear cars and I couldn't even hear cars. So I knew it was very, very late. Well, perhaps I, I wasn't in that space. I don't know. But so I laid there and my mother had told us how to do like a meditative relaxation where you picture uh, your body as a bag of sand and you poke a hole in the top of your head. And as the sand drains, you start relaxing your feet and up your body. So I'm picturing this and I'm wanting to close my eyes, but something was telling me, don't close your eyes. You know, just, you know, I just did not feel safe. Something was wrong. So I turned, I didn't turn my body. I just kind of shifted my eyes over to the window and there was a street light out there and it was casting some, actually the light ended up casting more shadow than light into the room. But I, I looked out there, I tried not to move because something else that I had learned from early on is that if you made yourself as invisible as possible, sometimes they wouldn't bother you. If they thought you were asleep, or you weren't paying attention, they would ignore you. So I'm trying to pretend I'm still sleeping like a child where I've got my eyes squeezed and looking through my eyelashes and I'm eyes just turned over toward that window. And then I just kind of shifted around and I looked and the light was catching the brass doorknob. And so I stopped and I looked at that and it appeared to be starting to turn. And I thought to myself, my eyes are playing tricks on me. This was one of the things my mother told us when we would see things. Oh, your eyes are playing tricks on you. Um, and so I said, oh, oh I'm not going to look there. I'm not going to look there. And so I quickly shifted my eyes back to the window when I heard the click of the door and the slight squeak of the hinge as it began to open. And I was terrified. I didn't want to look. I, I, I did not want to see what was in there. I did not want to, I did not want it to know that I knew that it was there. I just, I just, but I couldn't, I was compelled. And so I glanced over and the door was open maybe a third of the way, probably two feet. And I looked into that darkness and in the darkness, I saw a man and he was, he was about my father's height, but he was thinner and he was wearing a long, what I now know as a nightshirt and he disappeared. He was only um, visible to about mid thigh. And then he just faded into the, into the darkness and he was standing there and he was wringing his hands, just wringing his hands and looking at me. And he wasn't looking at me in a threatening way, he was looking at me with so much sorrow and pain and grief. And when I caught his eye, he slipped a little forward and I kind of, you know, reflexively like moved, tried to move back in the bed and he stopped right inside the door and he kept looking at me. And as he and I were fixed on one another, I began to feel that hopeless 
terrible grief that he felt. And it was, I was a little girl. You know, I, I had been sad. I had been mad. I'd been angry. I'd seen rage. I, I had experienced many, many emotions, but never in my life have I, and not even since, have I experienced that hopelessness, that just agony, agony, agonizing um, sadness. And I just started to weep like I didn't cry like like heaving cries like a child does. I just tears just it was so overwhelmed tears just fell from my body, and I had so much compassion for him. I, it was the strangest thing. I was no longer afraid. I just felt so sad for him, and eventually somehow. I know this is this everybody says this but somehow I fell back asleep and when I woke up in the morning Kate was still sound asleep and she was on her side and I was on my side and our backs were together and I thought to myself oh boy that was a weird dream and I turned over and I sat up and the closet door was open and so I realized that it had not been a dream so after that, I began waking up more and those wee hours in the night. And I now, um, where I am in my life and in my experience, I imagine he was waking me up. There was something he was trying to communicate. But I was a little girl. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help him. But, and I didn't like it. I didn't like that feeling. It was, it was very emotionally abusive. You know, here's an adult making a child feel this, this agony. Um, and so I would try to, I would try to not connect to him, but this happened multiple times. And then one night, just as I was waking up, I sensed somebody else in the room with me. And I, I didn't know who it was. I knew it wasn't the sad man. I knew it wasn't any of the other spirits that spirits that I had ever experienced. It was somebody who loved me. And it was, I just felt it. You know, you can tell when there is someone who cares about you, especially children can tell. And I had been taught from early childhood, we would say our nightly prayers about, you know, our, our, to our guardian angel. And so I assumed that she was my guardian angel. And I just felt that she was there to protect me. And I was so relieved. And the next thing I know, she like leans down into my ear and she whispers, don't open your eyes. And so of course I didn't. And then she said to me, lift up, lift out and come with me. And I have no idea how I knew what she meant. But somehow I lifted my conscious self out of my physical body and it just kind of like lifted up. And then there was like this little pop thing and I was above. And the next thing I knew, I was out in front of my house and I could look up the street. The, the street light was on. I could see her car. I did not see my guardian angel. I never, ever saw her, but I knew she was there and everything was Everything was the same, but it was also different in that the light was this like permeating amber light. Everything was illuminated. There were no shadows. I noticed there was no shadow. I could not feel temperature. I could not feel like the ground under my feet or wind or I didn't even hear anything. I was in this place that was outside of my house that was a different place, a separate place. And then she sort of let me know that I could fly. And so I took a couple of steps and leapt and up I went. And I flew and I bounced off the side of the house like a tennis ball. And I, I played and I just swirled around and I just, it was so delightful and gleeful. And, and then after a time, I noticed the sky starting to get light. And all of a sudden I got very worried because if my mother woke up and I was out in front of the house, I was gonna be in big trouble. 
and I didn't know how to get back in. And all of a sudden she's there with me again. And she says, it's okay, just fall back in. And again, I knew what she meant. And so I just, and landed in my body with, with the start. Have you ever, ever had a dream where you wake up feeling like you're falling really fast into yourself and you wake up with that start? It was, that's what that was. I went back into my body and I woke up and I felt so rested and so euphoric. I, could, I couldn't believe it. I had been able to protect myself. My guardian angel had given me a tool to protect myself. So after that, if I would wake up in the middle of the night, I never even waited for the sad man to come. I would lift up and out. And for the longest time, I just hung out in my, in my yard. Then pretty soon I was able to go to the local park. I could go way up high over the trees. I was traveling. I could go anywhere I wanted. And then I could just will myself awake are back into my body as I did. And this was something that later when I was a teenager, I learned people call astral traveling. I called it um, my spirit travel. And I would just, I would just leave and I could go places wherever I wanted by just, just, I would visualize that place as I closed my eyes and I would look at this place between my eyes and wait for that place to appear in that space inside that light that appears between your eyes and then boom, I would shoot to that place. This was a, a skill that I practiced a lot while we lived in that house. And then when we moved, um, I didn't so often because it wasn't necessary. But then when I was 13 years old, I got really sick and um, I was, I was diagnosed diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And I was told that I was going to become more and more disabled and have a lifespan in my mid thirties. Fortunately, it was a misdiagnosis, but I was in very extreme physical pain. And so what I would do is I would leave my body to relieve pain for myself. So I could like just lift a little bit off of myself. If I was experiencing a painful procedure, I had multiple surgeries and things. Or when my friends, for example, were going to Ted's basement and I couldn't go to Ted's basement because I was in a wheelchair, I said, go, go, go. I'll just come. My, my, I'll, I'll come in my own way. And so I stayed in the backyard and I was able to go to Ted's basement and I watched them and I watched them make, it was when you would take pop tops off cans and they would come off and they had these little sharp things. Well, my friend was making a chain out of the pop tops and they were putting it on this, this plastic tree down there. And I watched all this and I heard the music they were playing. And, and then later on, when I saw them, I told them this, that I actually was there and I was able to see what they were doing. And a couple of them were creeped out. Um, some, you know, didn't believe me at all. And others asked questions. So that's when I started to do more research and found out that what I was doing was astral traveling. Um, and I've done a, it throughout, go ahead. I've got a couple of questions. I mean, I got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for sharing that. For me, that solidifies the fact that spiritual experiences are true experiences because how could a child experience all of these things without any access to information about these things. So that's that's the first line of questioning that I want to go down. I want to talk about the fact that you had 10, there was 10 of you, right? 10 siblings. Did, did any of your other siblings experience things like this? Were you able to talk to your family about what was going on? What was their reaction? Yes. Um, my When we talked to my mother, my mother would tell us that um, our eyes were playing tricks on us or we had vivid imaginations. And then after we moved, my mother admitted that she also was experiencing many things, but she couldn't protect us from it. So the best way she could do that was the way my mother would deal with things. We often called her Cleo, Queen of Denial. <laughs> and she said that if we didn't interact, that it maybe would not bother us so much. So by 
telling us that. But my siblings and I, all of us who lived there, the first five really became conscious beings there. And every one of us are sensitive and um, have all, we talked about those shared experiences. We talked about them while they were happening, um, living there. Um, and so we all confirmed it for each other. Some of us saw things that the others didn't, but at the same time, you'd sense that it was something was going on. And so we always believed each other because we all saw things that other people didn't all the time. And then after we moved, we talked about those stories a lot. And those became um, like the family stories. And I'm, I'm a storyteller. And so I tell those stories. And that's how I ended up writing my first book, because the first book the first part of the first book is all the stories or the, the primary stories from that place. Um, my children asked me to write them down because they loved me telling them and they wanted to not lose them. So I did. <laughs> I love that. Wow. That must have been really amazing to be able to have some confirmation of your experiences regardless of whether or not you're exposed to this information, those are strange experiences. <laughs> so to hear from your siblings, like, oh my goodness, me too. And then to share information back and forth, that must've been just like giving you like a nice sense of community with your family. Very much, very much. And then people that lived there after us also communicated experiences in that house, including um, when I was an adult, in my, you know, maybe, I don't know, about 20 years ago or so. Um, I live in Michigan now, and I was in was in Chicago with a friend, visiting a friend of hers, and I was telling the stories of her wine one night, and they said, is the house still there? And he said, yeah, let's drive by. So we drove by, um, no relative lives there now, and we stopped in front, and I was pointing out places and telling stories, and my friend convinced me, because I'm easy that way, to go knock at the door. And when I knocked at the door and I said, hi, my name's T.I. Shippers. And he said, Shippers, are you one of the Shippers who lived here? And I said, yeah. He says, oh, my gosh, I have so many questions. So they had been experiencing things, too, which also kind of affirms that we were not just delusional. Also, all the obsessive things that we did disappeared the day that we moved into the new house. We no longer needed to check the closet door. I am not afraid of closets. Um, and so that sort of confirms that, yeah, there was something weird about that place. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? Those moments of confirmation, I think, are the most important part of that spiritual, the spiritual journey, finding moments of confirmation, that tangible evidence that, okay, I'm not crazy, or it's okay to be crazy in this insane world, whichever way you want to look at it, you know? Right. The other question that came up for me was, uh, well, I know that now you, you know, you describe yourself as a, as a spirit medium. And I'm curious if you've been able to gather any information around who that man in the nightgown was, was he someone specific to you, someone specific just to the house, or have you ever been able to come, come up with any other information about it? Actually, yes. <clears throat> so when we first moved, um, we found there were, when we first moved, my uncle moved in. And then when they moved out, it was being sold outside of the family. So we emptied the attic with all the trunks. And there we found tons of photographs and pictures. And we found a trunk that had all kinds of paperwork and things from these two brothers called the Davidsons. And it was the Davidsons who my great, great grandmother had purchased the home from. Um, well, not them, but their, their attorney. And there were, we found in the bottom, um, towards the bottom, a, 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 a collection of letters that were written to friend Davidson and then signed fondly C. And they were love letters. And the early ones were, you know, cordial and they got more and more sweet as they went on. And there were probably eight or 10 maybe of those letters in there. And C, my father had, the, we had a, an entity there we called the Slinky Lady. My father had a dream. Of, we called her the Slinky Lady because she would move. You could see the front of her, and as she would take a step, it would take a while for the light to catch up like a slinky toy. And so that's what we called her, the Slinky Lady. And my father dreamed about her, 
and he dreamed the name Kara. And so then we found these letters with, with C, and when we showed them to my father, this is after we moved, he recalled that dream and said, I bet this is Kara. So then as, and then all this stuff just went back in the trunk. We never did any more research. We knew the only information we had about them is they were politicians, they worked for the city. And my great, great grandmother had said they were not good people. Um, and I asked my father, what do you think that meant? He says, well, they disappeared. The brothers just vanished and the house was then sold by their executor or whoever. And um, he said they probably stole money and, and left or were some, whatever. And, and this didn't sit right with me because at the time they were operating, that was the norm. You know, everybody was making money. This is just after the great Chicago fire. And there was boodling and all this, you know, all this graft and corruption within the city. And and my great great grandmother wouldn't have said people who did that were not good people. So it was something else. And that always kind of just sat with me. So then as I was writing the book um, about with the stories from my childhood, my younger daughter read the stories and said, these are great. I love these stories, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. But this isn't, this book should not be just the ghost stories. This is the story of how you became the spirit medium that you are. This is your origin story. So put yourself in there. And I was like, oh crap, because now I have to kind of relive all the trauma of my childhood and put myself in there. And it was, it was very traumatic. It was very triggering, but I did it. And then as I was writing, as I was getting towards the end of my second rewrite, putting myself in it, I started being visited at night by the ghosts of my childhood in my room, including the sad man, including the slinky lady. And there was another, that, that these three that would show up in my room. And I do not let ghosts or spirit bother my sleep. Um, I have put up protections and if somebody comes in in my sleep, I'm like, ah, 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 back up, catch me when I'm, uh, you know, the shop not open card is up and send them away. But what was happening is I was waking up to them and I was really scared. And I'm not afraid of ghosts. I There is nothing that I have ever seen to be afraid of, but I was, my heart was beating fast. I was really afraid. And I realized that it was like the trauma trigger that was making me afraid. So finally, one night they woke me up and I was like, okay, okay, okay. I get it. You've got, you want to tell your side of the story. Wait till morning. And when I get to my computer, I'm yours, have at it. And I've never, you know, when I communicate with, with spirit, what happens is they kind of, it's not, I don't like hear them tell me a story. It's all of a sudden, like, I know the whole thing. It's like a memory. Um, but I know it's not my own memory. And, but it's, it's clear, it's vivid. And I can see and know everything that happened all of a sudden. And so... At, at this time, when I was writing this, I had been in an accident and I was out of work. And so I was sitting at a, a raised desk downstairs, not even in my office here, typing, doing finishing the last stuff, my arm on a pillow. And I sat down that next morning. I had my cup of tea and I said, OK, and then this story just came and I just started writing. And it was just like, and it started with one of them, just their story. Then the next one, their story. Then the next one, their story. And then the three of them together, their whole story about what happened to them. And as it turns out, um, the first thing that came is I knew their names. And then I knew what happened as they grew up, all but one. Charles, I didn't, he didn't show me him growing up and that was the man in the in the closet. I knew who they all were by their story, by what happened to them. And this, I wrote the whole second half of the book in probably three weeks. And in it, there are multiple very specific details like names of places in Greece, um, words, Greek words that, I don't know Greek, um, that were, I was just typing. Um, 
places in Chicago prior to the prior to the fire, names of restaurants, names of things. And a few of the things I just like several a couple few days in, my husband, my poor husband, um, he would walk in the room and when I was doing this, it was so intense. It was um it was as it was channeling in a way that it was going right into the the computer. I was I started by like I was trying to write what I could see and then pretty soon everything went from third person to first person and it was just pouring out. And so I would stop and have to take a break and breathe and and get up and move a little bit and and try to, you know, and it was disorienting. It was so bizarre. So my husband would come in the room because I'm set up in the living room. And if I was doing this and he would go to say something, I would just like side eye him and he just slink away, you know, like because I couldn't stop. And um, it was so weird. I've never experienced anything since or before like that. But then a couple of times when I was taking a break, I said, okay, so I have the name of a place in Greece where a lake dried up and it caused famine. Would you just look that up and see if that's true? And so he goes on his little you know, Google and starts looking up. And um, I said it would have been in the 18, probably 60s, between the 1860s and 1880s. And so he just does a little search and he finds a lake that was actually drained to grow currants for, um, for Christmas puddings in England. And the name of the lake was the name I had written. And I had no idea of this. So I said, okay, I'm on it. Don't check anything else. And I just wrote the whole thing in three weeks. And that was their story. Mm -hmm. So then I went back to the trunk because now I want to see if all this, I have their story and I have a trunk that had all their stuff in it. And my parents lived now outside of the city and all this stuff was stored in their basement. They had had a flood. And so all the stuff had been moved up to the garage. So I go there and the trunk is buried in the garage. So I said, next time I come, you know, we need some strong men to move all this stuff because I got to get in that trunk. And I started going through and the top layers were intact and the last two inches were like ash. You know, it was just, it had been, it had been compromised and all those documents didn't survive. But I have a handful of documents, including like a doctor's note, like a doctor's bill that fit with the story. I have um, a precinct check sheet. I have other, um, just very few documents, but with their names. And um, this, uh, so I've looked up, I've tried to look up their names um, and I, I have not been able to find much more than that, but it was all I needed. And this wasn't a research project. All that needed to happen was for their story to be told. They had a tragic end and they had been lost in obscurity. And, oops, I got to plug in here. Hold on a second. And they um, they wanted their story told. So as soon as their story was told, I think they found peace. And I haven't seen them since. So there's that. Let me get my cable and plug in. Hold on a second. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, a lot of stuff came up for me. And I think that, you know, the, the great mystery remains and that's okay when some parts of the story, I mean, I think for a lot of people who have spiritual experiences, no parts of the story ever really get confirmed. So it's incredible that you were actually able to find confirmation. Uh, and I'm sure that for you, that really helps with your spiritual development because like, you know, you got, you're on the right track. You, you know, I just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing these pieces of yourself with us today. And I want to see if there's anything else that you want to share to feel more complete about our time together. Well, I think I'd like to finish, tell you a little bit more about my guardian angel, if I could. So when I was, um, my 40th year was a year of great change for me. It, 
I was, I had been re-diagnosed with something that was more treatable. Um, obviously I had survived through my thirties. Um, and I had, uh, I had new energy and I also had a new psychic awakening. I was having dream series and, and things that were just connecting me so much to the whole universe. It was really profound. Um, and one night I dreamed a day of my childhood and I saw everything from the minute I woke up till the, when I went to bed, it was this vivid, it was like someplace in my memory, in my brain triggered this dream and I saw the whole thing. And I woke up and at, right after this dream and I thought, wow, what a gift that was. And then I started thinking, I wonder, I wonder what that house is like now. So instead of going back to sleep, I did my, my procedures for leaving my body. And I spirit traveled out and I found myself in that front yard again. And I was looking up at the house and it looked exactly the same, nothing had changed. And then I noticed that the car in the driveway was the pink and white station wagon that we had. And nothing had changed. It was like, it was like I had gone back there. Now I knew that I was not dreaming because this was a willful out of body experience uh, and the light was ch different. You know, I was moving, could have been, it was definitely an out of body experience. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna go in the house and see. And I saw the living room and I could see the toys on the floor and I could see every little detail like like a cigarette burn in the, in the arm of the couch. And I looked in my parents' room and they were spooning in bed asleep and they were so young and, and I just loved them all so much. And I, I thought I wanted to go up and see myself too. So it wasn't like you walk through space. I just was then in my bedroom and I went into the front bedroom and I wasn't there. And so I went in the little bedroom. And I also was curious because now I am in a liminal space and I was wondering if the spirits were in that same kind of space. And if I was going to encounter any of them, I was really curious to see if that was going to happen. But I wasn't afraid because I knew I could just zip out of there any moment I wanted. And I was looked in the room and there was my little sister, my big little sister, Kate, and myself in the bed. And I was just, just, it was, you know, I know in Back to the Future, you're not supposed to look at yourself in the past, but nothing happened except that I just loved them so much. And then I could sense something coming in. I could sense that darkness coming closer. And I was like, oh, no, you don't. There is no way. There is no way this is going to happen. And then I saw my little self just kind of turn over on her back and start to mm, mm, groan, like waking up. And so I leaned down and in her ear, I whispered, don't open your eyes. And I told her to lift up and come with me. And as soon as we were outside, I realized, I realized what had happened. Now, after, after this experience, when I came back in my body, it was still nighttime. My poor husband is still sleeping and I wake him up and said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. He knew the story of how I learned to spirit travel. This was a story I told all the time. I said, it was me. I'm the one who told me how to do it. I was my guardian angel. So this space is not only just a parallel liminal space. This is a space that has no constraints of time or anything, that everything is possible. This is just how I see things. And although I've tried many times to go back in the past, um, when spirit traveling, I have never been able to do it again. So maybe it was just meant 
from somewhere else to just be that one time to help keep me on this path. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That was the hit that Rodney in our accounting department was talking about of your story. So thank you for pulling that together for me. That's incredible. So incredible. And of course, it opens up a million routes to conversation about what is what is the true nature of reality? What's really going on? That's phenomenal. Thank you so much. And it, you you talk about it so eloquently too. It's like you're really with you while you're sharing your stories. So I really appreciate your attention to detail and creating a whole scene for me to follow along with. And I'm sure everybody watching as well. And we'll have all of your links in the liner notes of this episode so people can connect with you. And I just want to thank you again for taking time out to serve our community today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. We'll see you next time. See you later.